Hey, can we thank the band this morning for bringing us in? We are going to start the new year with a service that's a little different than normal. Um, we're going to dive into a subject that's really untaught in church. Many people go their whole Christian life and not hear any messages on the topic we're going to look at today. Um, and then we're going to have the band come back and do a little music at the end. We're going to look at questions that I hear people who are convinced and unconvinced about the Bible ask all the time. Questions like, where does grace and works come together? Questions like, what happens when you die? Questions like, um, is it okay to want to be rewarded at the end of your life for how you lived? Especially as you're making New Year's resolutions and looking at uh, you know, plans for this year. What does God reward us for? How do we prioritize? Questions that our friends have or maybe we have but never wrestled through. Like, how can it be fair that a moral atheist gets the same punishment and goes in the same bucket as Adolf Hitler? That doesn't seem fair. And how does it seem fair that like Billy Graham, who lives his whole life faithfully, gets the same reward as, say, the thief on the cross and a deathbed convert? These are a lot of questions that what we're going to look at today are two events in history that explain a lot of these questions and give us motivation for living. And the main idea I want to look at is this. Works are not a resume for entrance into heaven. Our good works, our good deeds... They are not a resume for entrance, but they are a record for reward. God rewards us for how we act. God rewards us for how we please him. God rewards us for our obedience. So how can those two things exist? How can it not be a, a, a way to get in, but it is something we are rewarded for? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. There's two events in the Bible. One is described as and called the Great White Throne Judgment. I'm going to call this one the Entrance Interview. The other one is called the Bema, or the Judgment Seat of Christ, and I'm going to call this one the Reward Banquet. Two separate events described in the Bible. This one is occasionally taught in church. This one is hardly ever taught in church. But when you understand the two together, these two events explain a lot of those questions that we just mentioned. And they help us know how to prioritize our life in light of our rewards. They know how to understand and answer questions our friends might have. And if you remember the story of Jim Elliott... If you know the story of Jim Elliott, in the 1950s, he decided to go down to be a missionary to Ecuador. He was in his 20s, and everybody said, don't go there, that's a dangerous place, stay here, be a youth pastor, you'll be a great youth pastor here in the States, stay in the, your comfort. He said, no, 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 I've got to go down and, and tell a group who've never heard about Jesus, about Jesus. So he went to a group, a tribe, and this tribe was known, in fact, the name of the tribe meant savages. So he goes and meets with the savages. Just has a general, hey, I'm here to meet you, had learned the language. He'd just recently gotten married to Elizabeth. And the three guys who came out to meet him speared him to death. And we say, what a waste. The Bible says there's a special crown for those who get martyred for their faith. Was that a waste of a life or was that investment of a life? And now you're his wife, Elizabeth. What do you do? Do you run back home? Oh, my goodness. What were we thinking? Or do you do what Elizabeth did, which is Elizabeth befriended that tribe Women in the tribe gained influence in the tribe to the time at which she was introduced into the tribe and they were so struck that a woman that they had killed her husband would love them and tell them about a God who loved them and wanted to forgive them that the whole village ended up coming to Christ because of Elizabeth's faithfulness in communicating the gospel of Jesus to a group of people who had killed her husband. Why would she do that? Why put herself at risk? Why would Jim put her, himself at risk? Well, here's two quotes from Jim that I love. He said, we should be all that we can be on earth so that we can be all that we could be in heaven. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he can never lose. And he said, you know, I may have lost my life here on earth, but it allowed me to be rewarded by a God in heaven. For giving my all for him the way he gave himself for me. So let's look at these two events together. The entrance interview and the reward banquet. The first one is the entrance interview. This is where God evaluates us for the resume we bring to him. In other words, many of us have a resume of all the good deeds that we do. And, and we may have written, not have written it down, but we've got it in our head. I did this nice thing for so-and-so, this nice thing for so-and-so. And, and we sort of minimize uh, you know, the, the bad things we do on the back. And God says that if you want, he will evaluate you fairly based on the resume you bring to him. So the question is, do you want God to weigh your interview? Because at that day, he will weigh your good and your bad. 
And you're going to find out, at least I'm going to find out, that my good's not nearly as weighty as I think it is, and my bad is far more weighty than I thought it was. In fact, the whole gospel, the whole Bible story is God saying, please, 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 I don't want to have to look at your resume. It's really not that great. Instead, if you will give up your righteousness, if you will stop trying to think you're basically a good person, and you will instead, I will exchange your bad resume for Jesus' glorious resume. Then when you come to God, you can hand God Jesus' resume, His righteousness, and it goes on the side of the scale to your account, and it comes with the promise of everything Jesus did. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You don't just get forgiven for what you've done. You actually get the righteousness or resume of Christ. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you can bypass the entrance exam. You don't have to have God evaluate your resume. Because you're handing him Jesus' resume. Saying, why should I let you into heaven? Well, your entrance exam is perfection. You must be perfect to get into heaven. Jesus was the only one who lived perfectly. So you can get in based on your resume or his resume. Now, I was talking with a friend who was really struggling with this idea of his friends who were not Christians or had not heard about Jesus and the idea of God evaluating them. He said, it just doesn't seem fair. So here's a great just freedom, I hope, for you, is that God is never unfair. God is the source of fairness. He's the source of justice. God can only act fairly. So everyone will be treated fairly. Everyone will be treated fairly. And they will be evaluated fairly based on their resume they bring to God. That's the good news. The bad news is, I'm not sure anyone wants to be treated fairly. Do you? Let's look at what that means. See, one of the challenges is that as modern people, we think God must be fair. And we add on this new piece. And for God to be fair, he must reward everyone for their sincerity. Huh. This is a very modern idea. C.S. Lewis addressed this in an essay called God in the Dock. Here's what he said. The ancients, that included the pagans, the Romans, the Greeks, the Jews, everybody in history prior to the modern man approached God or even the gods as the accused approaches a judge. Meaning, God, I know I am not clean. I know I've not done everything right. I'm approaching you as I'm in the witness stand. I'm the defendant and I need to defend what I've done in my life. However, for the modern man, the roles have been quite reversed. He, modern man, is the judge, and God is in the dock. God is in the defense council. He's on trial. Modern man is a kindly judge. If God should have a reasonable defense for being the kind of God who permits war or poverty or disease, well, I'm ready to listen to it. And and perhaps the trial will end in an acquittal if God has a good explanation for what he's done. Now, do you see how arrogant that is? But do you see how much that has impacted our thinking today? We come in and we judge God for judging, and God's got to explain himself. In the words of Ricky Ricardo, God, you've got some explaining to do, Lucy. Right? That's the attitude we bring. And this is a very modern concept. Most people in human history wouldn't even think this way. But it's a reality where we're at. I was uh, doing an interview years ago at... Cincinnati Country Day School about six years ago, and I brought a rabbi in, and we were just discussing the differences and similarities between Christianity and Judaism. We get to the end of our talk, got about two minutes left, and I said, hey, it's nice having you with us today. Um, We really appreciate the conversation. He says, can I ask you one last question before we go? I said, well, sure. He says, so I'm a Jewish Orthodox rabbi who spent my whole life devoted to the Torah. Do you think I'm going to hell when I die? (laughs) <laughs> I might want a cracker or something. Yeah. I had two minutes to answer this question. I said, well, at the end of your life, you have one of two choices. You either get fairness or forgiveness. We've spent the last 40 minutes together, and you've shared with us that you're basically a good person. You've also shared that all of your kids have always been obedient because you raised them according to the Torah. So since you think you're basically a good person, you're going to bring your resume to God, and he's going to weigh it fairly... And you're going to get a fair trial. He's like, then why are you trying to convert me? I said, because I don't think you're going to do well in that trial. I think your good works aren't nearly as good as you think they are, and your bad works are far worse than you think they are. 
I said, I know for me, I don't want a fair trial. I want to come before God and say, I want to bypass the entrance exam, get in based on Jesus' resume, because I want forgiveness and not fairness. See, the problem in the human heart, the biggest problem, is this. We think we are basically good people. I'm basically a good person. As long as I get what I want. Then you get married. Then you have kids. Then you have a roommate. You realize you're not basically a good person. And so the biggest challenge in bypassing the entrance exam is finally realizing that you're not basically a good person, that your resume is not adequate, that it does not live up to what you think it lives up to. I uh, got a chance just in the last couple of years to just see just the propensity of the human heart to justify itself. I got invited into a few family crises involving two guys in this case, both who had had an affair. And invited me into that moment, the secret had just come out, the unfaithfulness had just come out, the cheating had just come out, the lying had just come out. And I just said, well, how can I help? And this long conversation about what happened and how we got here and what was involved. And, and at the end of sort of an hour of just sort of spewing out all this stuff, the guy turned to me and goes, but I want you to know something. I said, what? I, I'm really basically a good person. Two guys in the same year, even with all the evidence presented before him of lying and unfaithfulness and cheating and all this stuff, still the human heart says, yeah, 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 but, but, but know that my intentions wasn't to hurt anyone. Know that my intentions was to be a good person. At the great white throne judgment or the entrance exam, the truth comes out. No longer can we spin. This is, this is the no spin zone. The only thing God does is he makes sure the truth comes out when he evaluates our resume. Now, let me give you some verses to sort of support this. In the book of Revelation, it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, everyone who's died is going to be addressed here, I saw the dead, small and great, whether you're low in the pecking order or high in the pecking order, everybody will give an account, standing before God. And the books, we're going to talk about two different books, one book here, one book here. The books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, who brought their own resume, why we're basically a good person, were judged according to their works. By the things written in the books, what did you do, what did you not do? The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each according to their works. God gives everyone a fair trial. Which means that when Hitler brings his resume, if you read Mein Kampf, he actually thought he was doing a loving thing. God will evaluate him based on what really happened. And the moral atheist will be evaluated based on what he's done. And so the atheist who thinks they're moral and Hitler who thought he was moral will both be evaluated by God and they will be punished or evaluated fairly. I'll give you a verse to reference this. In the book of Luke, Jesus shows up. And he's talking to a city. He says, woe to you, Charizan. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works I'm doing here had been done in that nation of Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented a long time ago if they'd had access to this kind of information. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. So he's talking to two different groups that rejected Jesus or God, one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. And he says, God will evaluate them differently. And one, it will be more tolerable than the other. In other words, one person gets more judgment than another. To which again, we say, oh, I don't like this idea of God judging people. Well, think about this. How many times have you or your friends said, why doesn't God do something about the problem of evil? We get mad at God for not doing something about the problem of evil. This is the time he does something about the problem of evil. We sort of sometimes smack God around. God can't judge and he ought to judge quicker. Well, he's so schizophrenic. This is the answer to God punishing evildoers. This is the fair evaluation of each person of what's called the great white throne judgment. And you can see it's different for different people. Another thing we notice is how fair it is. In the book of Romans, it addresses this issue of what about those who've never heard versus those who have heard. Look what it says. It's really fascinating. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it says in Romans 3. But many of us have sinned without the law. We didn't know about Jesus. We didn't know about the Bible. So we will be evaluated without the law. We're not going to be asked about things we didn't know about. As many who have sinned in the law, they did grow up with the Bible, they did grow up knowing about Jesus, will be judged by the law. 
For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Verse 14. When the Gentiles who did not have the law, they have not heard about it, by nature do the things in the law, although not having the law, they become the law to themselves. I mean, he's a lawyer, so let me sort of explain what he's saying. You will only be asked based on what you know. If you grew up with the Bible, you'll be asked about it. If you didn't grow up with the Bible, you won't be asked about it. You get a fair trial. And those people who did not have it become a law to themselves. Meaning their heart, their conscience will either excuse or accuse them and their secrets come out. Now listen, what could be more fair than this? God says, when you stand before me, if you want to come on your resume, I will use not my standard of righteousness, I'll use your standard of righteousness. You're a law to yourself. Did you live up to your own standard of right and wrong? Example, did you complain when people gossiped about you? Yes. Remember that time that you complained to people who gossiped about your daughter or your wife? Yeah. Great. So your standard of right and wrong is that you think gossiping is wrong. Something in your own heart, despite the fact you lived in a village nowhere near anybody else, you knew gossiping was wrong. Because you condemned other people for it. Did you ever gossip? Oh. Here's some examples of all the times you didn't live up to your own standards. Oh. And a fair trial based on your standard of right and wrong is that you don't live up to your own standard and you're guilty. Did you like it when other people lusted after your wife, your mom, or your sister? No. In fact, I beat up that guy. I hit that guy. I pushed that guy. I went to battle for that guy for doing that. Okay? So your standard of right and wrong is that you shouldn't lust after somebody else's wife, mom, or sister. Did you ever lust after somebody else's wife, mom, or sister? Oh, you did. Several times per day. Then you are guilty based on your own standard. And notice this. You, your conscience becomes the very thing that is condemning you. In other words, you are the prosecuting attorney of yourself. You condemn yourself here. God says, I'll use your standard and you become the prosecuting attorney. Could anything be more fair than this? And yet God says, even in all that fairness, you living up to your own standard, you being your own prosecuting attorney, I just make sure as a judge the truth comes out, everyone will be found guilty. Because no one's resume is good enough for entrance. Not to mention the fact that all your secrets come out. What about all your worst days when you lose your temper, when you lose your anchor, anger, if all that came out, would you really think that you're going to get entrance into heaven? I wouldn't. So here's your choice. Either Jesus is your defense attorney, and he defends you with his resume, and you bypass this experience to go to the Bema, or you get the fair trial you always thought you needed and wanted until you get it, and you go, oh my goodness. Why did I ever think or delude myself into thinking I was righteous? Arthur Brooks wrote a play. It's called After the Fall. A pretty famous play. And it has a narration in the middle of the uh, talk about a guy who gets rid of God. You know what? That's the problem with this religion. It's all about judgment. It's all about evaluation. Let's eliminate this nonsense. So he gets rid of the whole God thing. But he finds he's not free. He, doesn't, he isn't free from guilt. Here's what the narrator says. For many years I looked at life like a case at law. It was a series of proofs. When you're young, you've got to prove how brave you are, how smart you are. Then what a good lover you are. Then what a good father you are. Finally, in the later stages of life, you've got to prove how wise or powerful or whatever you are. But underlying it all, I see now there was a presumption that one moved on an upward path towards some elevation where God knows that I would be justified or even condemned. A verdict anyway. I think now that my disaster really began when I looked up one day and the bench was empty. He got rid of God. There was no judge in sight. And all that remained was an endless argument with oneself. The pointless litigation of existence before an empty bench, which of course is another way of saying despair. So here's a person who's not a believer in Jesus, not a believer in God, who says, 
There's something hardwired into us that knows that we're going to be accountable for our actions, even to ourselves, and that we don't live up to those standards. Now, the good news is, if you're a follower of Jesus, you would never say you're basically a good person. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You've exchanged resumes. Because you know your resume, your works, are not a resume for entrance. You're getting in based on his. So now we're going to move from this event, the entrance interview, to what the Bible describes for Christians as the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ. Now to do that, I want to show you a video clip. This is a church down in uh, Texas, I believe, who did a two-hour reenactment of the Bema seat. It's a little more religious than we would be here, but I don't know a lot of people who've done a drama in acting, acting out the Bema seat of Christ. As an elder team this year, we watched this whole two hours uh, last year as we were preparing for what God would have us do this year. And it was so impactful for us that we wanted to share with you some of the ways we were impacted by our motivation to be faithful to God, to his word, and to our mission based on this particular teaching of the Bema. Let's watch. Daniel. Yeah? We need to talk about the Bema. (laughs) Yeah, the what? The Bema. The judgment seat of Christ. Oh, I, I already went through that. There was a big room. It was like a growing room, and there was a white throne. And I, I yes, did that already. yes, that was the great white throne judgment. But soon there will be a completely different kind of judgment for everyone in the church. In fact, judgment probably isn't the best word to describe it. As, well, that conjures up in the minds of those new to heaven the possibility of rejection or punishment for their sins. This is more of a celebration. Well, the image was taken from a seat in the ancient world of Earth. It was usually located in the center of town, and it had a bank of steps leading up to it. Different activities took place there. Magistrates ruled on cases, awards and prizes were handed out. Great accomplishments were celebrated. Well, there is a Bema seat here in heaven, and soon Jesus will sit upon it, and every child of God will mount those steps and have a personal conversation with Jesus. Uriel, this is terrifying to me. You need to tell me exactly what's going to happen there. Uh, Daniel, you have nothing to fear. This isn't a punitive judgment. This is a reward judgment. It's like at the end of the Olympic Games when you get to stand on the platform and receive your reward. That's what this judgment is about. Christ is going to commend you for what he did of eternal significance through you. It's really stunning, actually. He is going to reward you for his work through you. What was that, Uriel? It's time. It's time for the celebration. Christ is calling everyone to the Bema. Let's go. And Uriel picked me up, and we started to fly. And I looked to my right, and I looked to my left, and there were thousands, millions of other believers being flown in the same direction. I looked down, millions of Christians running towards this little circle off in the distance. As we continued to get closer, I realized that was a terrible description. It was neither little nor just a circle. It was big, huge, miles and miles across, the size of a city, the size of a metropolitan area. And it wasn't just a circle, it was was more like a stadium. Magnificent stadium. Muriel set me down outside the gate. I can't go in any further. What do you mean? You're my angel. You go everywhere I go. No. This is a special moment just for the bride of Christ. But we angels will be watching up ahead. We'll be celebrating with you. But go in and enjoy your brothers and sisters in Christ. So this idea of the reward banquet is taught several times in the Bible. I'm specifically going to look at a detailed passage in 2 Corinthians. But I love what he said there. It's a time where God rewards us for the work he does in us. This isn't a motivation to go try and do works in your own power because outside of Jesus you can't do anything. But the minute you come to Christ, you're finally able to do good works because his Holy Spirit is in you. And now you are producing the fruit of his Spirit So the goal of the Christian life is to get close to Jesus daily so that his work can flow through you. And what's amazing is God then rewards you with wreaths and crowns and acts of service and eternity and future rewards based on the work he does in you. So here's what it says in Corinthians. Again, now Paul's talking 
to just Christians. He says, therefore, we as Christians make it our aim, our goal, our purpose in life, whether we're present with you or absent from you, whether you see us or when we're not seen by the people, we make it our goal to be well pleasing to him. Because he made us pleasing to him with his resume, we now want to live out a life of being pleasing to him. For we must all, all of us as Christians, appear before the judgment seat. And the Greek word here is bema, or bema, depending how you say it. The bema seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Which again was the image of those Olympic runners who would train their whole life, run the race, and at the end they would be given a wreath or a crown. This would be the ultimate, in the Greek world, the ultimate example of a prize that you had competed well, that you had ended the race, that you had run your life well. And that's the word that Paul uses here to describe what happens for Christians. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and each one of us is going to receive the things done in the body while we're on earth. Everything we do is written down. Everything matters. Everything will be rewarded. God has got a a whole host of gifts and rewards. He can't wait to give out to you. When you're faithful, when you're tempted to be faithless, when you're serving what seems like thankless tasks, serving a child, serving a spouse, serving your mom and dad, and you think nobody matters, this isn't, nobody cares, nobody sees this. God is documenting. God is watching. You're going to be so surprised at the Bama seat that little sacrifice you made in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you forgot about. And God says, oh, my goodness, I remember that. I remember that. And he just starts pouring rewards upon you. Like, thank you, God. I didn't even remember that. Thank you for doing life with me. All of those acts of seemingly sacrifice when you're serving people who are crabby and not thankful, when you're continuing to swallow your pride or be slow to anger or be quick to listen. God rewards us for all of those, for the things done in the body, according to what we have done. Now, look at this, whether good or bad. When you have this conversation with Jesus, he's going to evaluate your life with you and you're going to go over all the good stuff and the bad stuff, too. Which comes against one of our misconceptions that I thought God forgot about all the bad stuff. Well, he did forget about it for the sake of getting into heaven. He covered it with his resume. But now as a Christian... God doesn't forget about what you did. He walks through your life and there's going to be tears at the Bema seat. That's why he has to wipe away your tears. You're going to say, oh, if I'd known now or then what I know now, I would have lived differently. I would have spent differently. I would have served differently. I would have sacked. Oh, there was so. And God says, here's the gifts I have for you. And, and, and open this door. Here's the gifts I wanted to give you. Here's all the missed opportunities. And there's no condemnation here, but there's going to be a sense of, oh, I had such a higher purpose. I wish I had lived every day in light of this day with him. Knowing this, therefore, that we're going to stand before God, knowing in the fear of God, the, the awe of God, that we persuade men. We want other people to know this. And this is why Horizon has always done what we do. We are persuaded to persuade other people to create environments for people because we think people aren't going to do well at this trial. And we think the good news is that you don't even have to be at this trial. The good news is Jesus giving you his resume. So we're persuaded to please God by trying to persuade other people to take Jesus' resume, not your own. And we're persuaded that God has incredible rewards that we don't want our friends to miss out on and we don't want to miss out on. That's our motivation. That's the Bama seat. Based on this passage. Now, three quick misconceptions. One, many people think since God forgave everything and forgives and forgets, there's nothing to evaluate. But we just saw in 2 Corinthians, he says, no, no, God's going to evaluate both the good and the bad for rewards. Not for salvation, but for rewards. The second misconception is after you become a Christ follower, your works don't matter. The Bama seat says, of course they matter. Go and read the gospel sometimes. You can't even get one page through the gospel without Jesus talking about rewards. Great is your reward. Great is your reward. When people persecute you, great is your reward. 30-time reward, 60-time reward, a hundred-fold reward, he says. God designed us to be incentivized. And he says, I will reward you. Works do matter. They don't get you in the door, but they do have rewards I have for you, for your faithfulness. 
Now, if you grew up Catholic or Protestant, you struggle with one of these two events. Typically, people I interact with who grew up Catholic struggle with the idea that it's just by God's grace you get in the door. So come on, works of God play a role here. I was talking to a friend years ago who sort of grew up with that idea. He said, I finally came to the place I realized that Jesus was brutally killed, died for me, and what he did on the cross was sufficient. What was I going to add with my good works that was going to make Jesus' resume better? You see, that if you really think you need Jesus plus your works, you're saying Jesus' resume is inadequate. And are you really going to add to Jesus' suffering? Are you really going to add something to his resume that he lacks? He said, that was the moment that I realized I couldn't add anything to Jesus' resume, that I was able to finally get this. Now, Protestants who grew up their whole life, it's not works, it's not works, it's not works, it's not works, they struggle with this one. You mean works do matter? Of course they do. They just don't get you in the door. I don't know about that. Wouldn't it make sense that the Billy Grahams who spent their whole life in service and faithfulness and ending well would be rewarded differently than the deathbed convert? This is the answer to that question. This is the answer to why you're faithful, why you resist temptation, why you pursue God, why you want to run the race as an athlete. Because, of course, you're rewarded differently. Some who had ten were given ten. Some who had five were given five. And some who wasted their one talent were given nothing. This is all about rewards. And third misconception is people think it's selfish to want to be rewarded. It's never selfish to pursue the things God tells us to pursue. Why would God spend so much time talking about pursuing rewards and then smack us over the head for wanting those rewards? He talks about crowns of glory, the crown to the martyr, the crown to those who are sacrificed, the crown. There's lots of rewards because God knows. He designed us to be incentivized and he rewards us for that. Go back to the passage. We want to be pleasing to Him. Therefore, in light of the fact we're going to be there, we want to please Him. We want to persuade other people. It's a motivator for our living. I shared the story this last year about the CEO of Pat Gelsinger. He's the CEO of Vimware, a gigantic technology company. He's a follower of Christ who's really thought through the implications of wanting to be rewarded by Jesus at the Bema Seat. Here's what he said in the article, Tech Magazine. I make a lot of money, so I can give a lot of money away. We have a small foundation, but most of it, our money, we love to give directly from our revenue and overall holdings that we have. My wife and I set an objective early on to increase the percentage of our gross income every year to charities. So that when they were young and first married, every year they started giving another percentage away. We're almost at 50%. For every dollar I get, I'm giving away 50% of my gross income. You know, I've got a home in California. We've kept a home in Oregon. We have a vacation home in Oregon. Sometimes I wonder, how many bedrooms does one man need? And this article went on to describe that he was giving away $20, $30 million a year, I think is what the number was. Incredible amount of money. And we look at it and go, what a fool. Why would you do that? Because he knows what Jim Elliott knew. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he can never lose. He gets that this world is but a training ground of faithfulness because he who is faithful in the little things will be entrusted greater things. And when heaven returns to earth, God will reward us with acts of service. Which means some of us will be mayors of countries. Some of us will be presidents. Some of us will will give leadership roles in the new heavens and new earth. I always thought it would be great if I could be the the president of Chad. I thought that would be kind of nice. But, you know, when I think of the prayer warriors, when I think of those who've lived so faithfully and been martyred for their faith, even today, as you think of those Christians who are staying before ISIS and refusing to deny their faith, God says there's a special crown for those who are martyred, the Jim Elliots, the Christians, the Coptic Christians who are dying even today because of that kind of persecution. And I don't think I'm going to be the mayor of Chad. I think I'm probably going to be a janitor somewhere, and I'll be so delighted that God would reward me for my life just based on that. So I want to give you a picture again from this video of what it might look like or feel like to be at the Bema and receive your award. Let's watch. It's time to begin. I will call you down name by name. 
Prepare your hearts for the Bema. Jesus went back to his throne and sat down. <laughs> you could hear the proverbial pin drop. The angel slowly walked up to the front of the platform and took his staff and slammed it into the ground three times. Pompania. Pompania was from the first century Rome. She was one of the first, if not the first, of the senatorial class to put her trust in Christ. She was a Christian even before Paul arrived in Rome. Wow. Her friends made fun of her. Her husband did too. But through her steadfast love and her simple witness, he eventually came to Christ. And they planted a church in their home. And this church survived for three centuries and thrived there in Rome. Wow. <laughs> Jesus gave her the crown of glory for shepherding his people. And he said... Be glorified! And she was, and she was transformed. William Carey. An impoverished shoemaker in England in the 1700s. He barely had two pennies to rub together, but what he had, the passion for the lost. Especially those around the world that had never heard of Jesus and the rescue that he provides. He figured out a way to get to Malta, and he started a mission work there. And then he booked passage all the way to India. And he was the very first one to take the gospel, the good news, to the people of India. He was known on earth as the father of modern-day missions because his example lit a spark under a slumbering church. And around the world, there was a great mission movement as a result. And Jesus did something amazing with him. He came and he put his hands on his shoulders and he said, if anyone is here at the Bema because of my work through him, either directly in India or through the great mission movement, please stand now. And billions of people stood all around us and they all started clapping and cheering and they would say, thank you, William. Thank you. And as you can imagine, he was overwhelmed. Jesus held him and whispered something into his ear. And he was glorified and he was transformed. He went back to his seat and the angel pounded again. Joseph Ray Robinson. Joseph was born in the deep south when racism was still a scourge in our nation. He had eight children, so he worked diligently to provide for them. He shined shoes. He drove limousines. He worked as a security guard in office buildings. <gasps> it's Joe. It's Joe, the security guard from my office building. And I found out here at the Bama that there were seven people from my office building that were believers today because of the quiet witness of this man. Talk about misreading someone. <laughs> what a jerk I've been. Jesus raised him up off his knees said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Be glorified. And he was transformed in an instant and flew back to his seat. In the video series, which is based on a book by Tim Stevenson called The Bama, they are actually all true stories of people through history and what it might look like for them to be rewarded. What about for you and I? If this really is true, if this teaching really is true, what would it look like for you and I to live in light of this day? To prioritize in light of this day? Three things I think we get from the Bema. Three aspects of what it means to therefore in light of that be pleasing to him. Therefore, how do we invest or persuade other people to know this Jesus, to at least consider this Christ? Well, three aspects. One, rewards give us incentive. Therefore, we make this our aim because we may receive something. It's an incentivizing for living. And hear this. It is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God if you don't think He rewards you. Impossible. You cannot please God if you don't think He rewards you. 
in an increasing Marxist uh, world that we live in today that's gotten rid of incentivizing, it's gotten rid of reward, it doesn't make any sense at all, the Bible says it's impossible for us to please God if we don't think he rewards us. Those are my words. Those are the words of Hebrew. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, and verse 24 and 25. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And then he defines what faith is. For he who comes to God, that's what faith is. You come to God, you must believe he exists. Well, that makes sense. If you're going to please God, you ought to believe he exists. And you need to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And he doesn't just reward you with heaven. He doesn't just reward you with his presence. He doesn't just reward you with crowns of glory. He rewards you with doing life with him. Apart from the vine, you can do nothing. It's the rewards of being with Jesus. Not then, but now as well. It's the most important person in your life. Standing before everyone in the world... And saying, hey, these rewards are good, but even more, it's the person who gives them to you is even more, even more important. It says, I'm proud of you. You didn't just get into heaven by the skin of your teeth or by escaping fire. You're one of the few that get those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That we live our life with that sense of incentivizing that we want to hear those words from our Heavenly Father on that day. And for most of us, obedience in this life is a lack of incentive. If I told you today that we're going to have a, um, a reality uh, video crew follow you around for the next two days, for the next week, and if you can live for Jesus every day, connect with Him, love Him, obey Him, please Him, that when you come back next Sunday, we're going to show the videotape and we're going to give a million dollar check to everyone who lived pleasing to God. You might think twice before the road rage comes out when somebody pulls in front of you. In light of the incentive, maybe I'll, God, give me some self-control now. You may reprioritize your time, your schedule, your money in light of that reward. And the Bible says what God is offering you is far more than a measly million dollar check. He's offering you eternal rewards that moth cannot touch, they cannot eat, and rust can never destroy. That's the rewards he offers to us. You know, my son Javen's uh, 16. So he's going into his junior year. And part of what we talked about last year was he wanted to try and cram three years of college into his high school experience. Well, through the CCP program, it's free. I'm like, I like this idea. And so he's been taking four or five, he's going to take five classes this next semester while he's a junior in high school. And so I sort of organized it, figured it out, figured out how those all would aim at one particular degree, work with multiple schools to make sure I can get the right ones that are going to end, end up in this direction. And so we get this whole plan set out semester by semester. It started last summer and then this semester, and now we're setting up next semester. Lots of emails, a lot of me doing the groundwork to make it work. And then as we sit down, I said, now I want you to know, as you go through this process, I want to reward you for every class that you do faithfully. Because I'm still going to save a lot of money. And so we talked about incentivizing him for being faithful. Now, most of that is work I've done to create the mechanism to let this happen. But I'm delighted as his father to reward him for us doing this together, but reward him for even the things I'm doing through him, the things I'm preparing for him, to give him a life of, of no college debt later on. I'm trying to prepare that for him. In the same way, God says, I've got a purpose for your life, and I want to do it with you, and I want to put the work of my spirit through you, but I am delighted to reward you for the work I'm doing through you. It's another act of my grace. That's the power God says here. See, rewards give us incentive. They also give us a sense of responsibility because we know we're going to stand before God and everything we've done in the body, whether good or bad, we will give account for. I was reading the book based on the DVD by... Tim Stevenson, it's called the Bema. We have a few copies out there if you ever want to buy it. I read this, but every three years is a re-reminder of what it means to live in light that day. I was reading it about ten years ago, and I was really convicted. I Suddenly something came to mind, um, something I'd done in ninth grade. So Facebook was just getting popular then, and I found this girl that was in my ninth grade class. Her name was Jenny. And I, uh, I contacted Jenny. I said, Jenny, I, I just wanted to know, I want, you, I want to apologize she said, what for? I said, I, I know you know. I think every day of biology class I came in and every day I made fun of you. She had a speech impediment. For whatever reason, I made fun of her speech impediment. C 
seemingly every day of that ninth grade year. She says she doesn't remember it. I think it was just her being gracious. But I asked for her you know, forgiveness. I apologize. And she said, well, yeah, I forgive you. She ended up marrying one of my good friends from track. And I just was grieved that I would have done this. But in light of the Bema seat, I said, you know what? It's not that we as Christians do everything right. It's that when we do something wrong, we're called to make amends. We're called to, to go back and make things right. And she, again, was so gracious and, and forgave me. But I want to end that day, this is that sense of responsibility we get, is that when we realize we've harmed somebody, we realize we've hurt somebody, we're motivated to go back and make it right, to live peaceably with others as long as it depends on us, is what it says in the Bible. And that's how this, this Bema seat drives us to be accountable to our actions. And the last thing it mentions is it gives us motivation. Motivation to please Him. And this is why it's the gospel. This is why you need both these events. If it was just this event, then I would please him so that he would, be, he would accept me. And my whole life I'd be on this, this treadmill. Of, I've got to please him so he'll accept me. So that at the end of my life I'll get in. That won't work. The gospel says, because he made me pleasing to him through Jesus, I'm already accepted. And because I'm already pleasing to him positionally in Christ, since I'm already accepted by him through what Jesus did, and there's no condemnation, because of that fact, I want to please him who accepted me. Not I please to hope I'm accepted. And that's the power of the gospel. In light of what he did by bypassing the entrance exam, I want to live out the reality of that truth in my life. That's why I want to persuade other people. It's too good to be true. You've got to hear about this. It's why I I want to be pleasing to Him because He made me pleasing to Him. It's why we as a church have two services. It's why that we're we're so motivated to do what we do. It's why we as elders came together and watched this video to remind ourselves what it means to live in light of that day. So I want to invite the band to come up. I want to tell you what we're going to do here for the next year that might be helpful for you. One, if you enjoyed the, the BEMA video, we're going to cut it down from two hours to about an hour do some video editing, and we're going to show this here in our auditorium on January 31st, a Sunday night. So if you would like to come and watch the whole thing, and I'll do a Q&A afterwards, you can mark your calendars, there'll be information coming up, or we're actually going to show the Bema, or if you just want a copy of it, we've got a few out here you can buy on your own. But this is something we want to do, because many people have been impacted by this as we were as a leadership team. If you want to know more about this, uh, again, this is a short story. So it's not like, like a commentary, it's just a really engaging short story of what it would be like to be at the Bema seat. That's of interest to you. The last thing is, when we moved into our building five years ago, one of the things we did is we laid out our teaching schedule for the next five months because we thought you might be motivated to persuade other people. And as many times you're sitting in church, you go, oh, I wish I'd known the topic. I would have invited so-and-so. So we've worked in advance our team to tell you what we're going to do for the next five months. If you pull out this from your program, you're going to see for our equipping service here at 4.30 on Saturdays and 8.50, We're going to be going through the book of Exodus, a series called Catching Tears. Here's all the different topics for each week. And then we're going to repackage that because we're going to look at all the different plagues. I've been working on this for the last three months. It's going to be so great. It's called uh, Ready to Rumble. Uh, God takes on, Yahweh takes on the Egyptian pantheon. Fantastic stuff we're going to learn there. And this might be something to invite your friend who's convinced about Jesus but wants to grow deeper. The Exploring Service, which is 100% different, except this weekend I'm doing the same message at all four, But it's 100% different, totally different topic, totally different experience, aimed at your unconvinced friends. Here's every topic between now and May. We've got a series based on prism, what do God's names mean, a series based on custom home, the personal approach of Jesus. The personal approach, you might say, oh, i got a friend who's really blunt. How would God approach the blunt? I want to hear about that. Or trailblazer, influencers. Then we're going to do a series based on Bob Dylan songs and the book of Ecclesiastes. So where's meaning come from? Where's purpose come from? So use this as a tool to say, what's the best topic and the best date for somebody I want to invite? Because we want this to be a place that Christ followers deeper and deeper live in light of that day and that we create environments where people who don't know God feel genuine friendships from us and they get put in environments where they can begin to dig deeper and say, you know, I want to check this thing out. I want to see if it really is true. This next song speaks about that. What does it look like to live in light of that day when we stand before Christ? Father, we want to live in light of that day. 
not just because we want the rewards, but because we want the rewards from you. In light of everything you did for us, Father, we want to show you our gratitude. We want to live lives pleasing to you because we love you. We want to prioritize our resolutions this year, prioritize our plans this year, prioritize the people in our life this year. In light of that day, when we will not only give account but be rewarded, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for your love for us. And thank you that there will come a day there will be no more pain and no more sorrow where you do wipe away tears. We don't know if you're going to come this year or if it will be 100 years from now, but we want to live in light of the fact you may come at any moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for being here. Join us next week as we start this brand new series, Catching Tears Based on Exodus. Or if you invite your friends to PRISM, starts next week at 10, 11, 10. Thanks again. See you next week.